So today I'm going to be talking about um, a strange coop, uh, how closure saved my chickens from the evil raccoons. Um, and I figured this would be an appropriate talk for Portland. Um, I come from Seattle, where we also have lots of chickens, and uh, yeah, this is a thing. Um, so uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I did a startup, or, or I have a startup called Polis, uh, and we use data visualization and machine learning to make large-scale conversations make sense. And um, this is a free tool now, um, and you can, you can check it out at pol.is. Um, and this is kind of how I got into Clojure, and um, it's, it's a really cool project. I definitely recommend you check it out. Um, I'm not going to be talking about it uh, too much more than that, but um, uh, I should also add that um, right now we're bootstrapping, and um, so I'm looking for consulting work, so anyone who um, is interested in working with me, just um, you know, hit me up afterwards or um, you know, get in touch with me on GitHub or whatever. Um, so first, let's just establish some basic facts. Uh, raise your hands if you think raccoons are cute. Yeah, okay, okay. So this is a common misconception. <laughs> they're in fact evil. Um, uh, on the other hand, chickens are awesome. They are hilarious. They're like the trailer park boys of the zoological world because they're just so stupid and hilarious. Uh, like you can just watch them for hours. Um, so, but sadly, raccoons eat chickens and this is a big problem. Um, so last summer I moved into a new house uh, with my wife and um, the, uh, they, had a, they had a chicken run there uh, but it wasn't fully fenced in, so we had to lock the chickens in the coop every night and let them out in the morning. And so this was going to be a problem, you know, I couldn't go out and like just not worry about the chickens and I had to wake up early every morning and let them out and um, so like any good programmer, I sought to automate this. Um, so the rough plan was to have a light sensor that would detect the time of day and have a motor that would lift the door up and down and that this motor would, uh, sorry, that this door would have some kind of locking mechanism that would hold it in place and keep the raccoons from opening the door because raccoons are uh, kind of surprisingly thrifty. Um, and my plan was to run all of this uh, using closure on a BeagleBone Black. Uh, so here's the photoresistor that I used for the light sensor. Um, and th this is like kind of uh, Arduino 101, so yeah, it's really easy to go and find out how these things work and how to set them up. Um, I went to an old har hardware store uh, in, in town and um, they had an old used drill pile and found this old electric drill for $10, um, nine volt drill. And um, so I used this for the motor. Uh, the, the pulley system was pretty hacky. Um, <laughs> as you can see, uh, there's some glue, some plastic, some string. And so yeah, so I tied, I tied the, the string that goes to the door uh, onto this little loop there that's glued into the drill. Um, not how I do it again, <laughs> but uh, you know, it definitely worked, so. Um, the door design, I, um, you know, I thought about this a lot and it, it, there were all these sort of complicated things I was thinking in my head, oh, I'm gonna need a servo to like stick a pin in that's gonna lock it. And ultimately, I, searching around, I found something on YouTube from this guy named Clint Fisher who did uh, an automatic door. And he had this brilliant locking system, which I'll, I'll, I'll kind of clarify a little more later, but um, I went ahead and stole this because it was a really elegant solution to the problem. Um, so here's my adaptation to the door. Um, I changed things a little bit so that the the weight would would um, would uh, would try to make it a little more effective, um, but basically this little this round block here in the center pulls up and that pulls these two pins on the side in, which kind of releases this locking mechanism. And I'll show you this actually in installation in a little bit here. Um, so also one of the things I didn't really think about when I started this project was, oh, I'm going to need to have some way of being able to tell when the door has hit the bottom and when it's hit the top, otherwise the drill, you know. I want to make sure it gets down and not, not keep pulling any more than I need to. Uh, and so the simple solution with this was just put buttons at the bottom and the top of you know, where the door is going to hit <coughs> and have those hooked up via wires. Um, so that's kind of the physical setup of the system. But uh, the preparation of the BeagleBone Black uh, was, uh, seemed like it was going to be straightforward. Uh, and actually, there were some kind of thorny things I had to deal with. Um, and there are ways to dodge these. but. Um, uh, installing the JVM and a line again was pretty simple, um, except that line again doesn't like running as a root user. And sadly, the default installation, the default OS on the BeagleBone Black only has a root user. Uh, and so, you know, adding a new user is not a big deal, but you don't get permissions on all the pins. Um, and so there's basically the way these things work is there's uh, this sort of virtual file system representation of the pin states, and you can just write to these files to activate the pins and read from the pins and so on. Um, but if you don't have permissions to do that, then you can't do that. So th uh, it, this was a relatively simple fix. I just had to add some UDEV rules and stuff, but it, it took a little more work than I thought it would. So that's just something to kind of be aware of in this landscape. 
Um, Debian, the Debian installation for Beagle and Black might not have this problem, um, so that'd be something to look at. But um, and the last kind of thing that I did for setup, um, well, I actually did it at, at the end, but the kind of system level stuff uh, was setting up, um, you know, startup, startup scripts and stuff um, to get this thing running when when the board booted up, so that if if it uh, crashed, everything should come back up. Um, so now it's time for some code. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, won't be, I don't have a lot of time to go into a lot of detail, but um, just kind of some broad strokes of some of the things that I set up and some of the things that I thought are interesting. So one of the first things before I even started playing with the, the physical sort of side of the board uh, that, I was, that I was interested in was thinking about how to keep track of the time of day. And um, uh, you know, it, um, the, the sort of naive thing of just having a, thresh, a single threshold uh, for night and day doesn't quite work because you know these signals are a little bit jittery, and so if you just had a single threshold for night versus day, you'd sort of get the door like opening and shutting rapidly uh, <laughs> right as sunrise was coming, and you might hit a chicken, and that wouldn't be good. So, um, so yeah, what what I set up here is um, is a little state machine that um, it is kind of simple data, right? You know, this is the kind of very data centric approach, um, and you know you just keep track of a state, and you have transition functions. Um, the two different transition functions depending on what um, what the current state is. Um, so uh, if you know if it's daytime, then you use this transition function, and if it's nighttime, you use this transition function to get the new state. Um, and so this is pretty simple and um, and worked great, and was kind of fun to think about. Um, so pin reading and writing. Um, there are two kinds of pins that we that I had to deal with for this project: um, digital I/O pins, um, which used to turn things on or off or read buttons, that that type of thing, binary. Um, but then also the analog input pins, uh, which um, uh, w which have yeah, which have a range of values. Um, and I, I wanted to abstract this because I was also kind of thinking, you know, that I wasn't able to find a lot that was very general purpose uh, on on the internet. And so I thought it'd be fun to try to abstract this stuff and make a library out of it. So so I went ahead and did protocols for this um, because you know I wanted something that was kind of contractual, uh, so that you could play around with different implementations. Um, and so uh, I want to actually show you the implementations because it's basically just a bunch of file system junk. Like you're writing to files, and there's this whole kind of pattern on how to do that. And um, if you want to see the code, um, there will be a link up later here that you can check out. Um, but basically, we have a read and a write and an initialize and a close. Um, so you can open and close ports and read and write from them. Um, so buttons. Um, I, I, this is one thing that I actually would have done just as pure data, but again, I was kind of thinking about uh, what, what might something kind of contractual look like for a generalized library. And um, here I had this issue where one of the buttons was active when it was closed and the other was active when it was open. And so just to abstract this away, I did, um, I did uh, a protocol and some, and some um, record implementations. Um, but again, I think I would have done this actually um, just using uh, hash maps and, uh, and death multi. Um, uh, the last kind of uh, component here that uh, that was required uh, is the H bridge, um, and an H bridge is a special kind of circuit that you can use to turn a motor uh, in forward or reverse. And um, I should have put a picture up here for how it works. It's actually not that hard to explain, but um, basically you just you have four gates, and if you open two of the gates a certain way, then current goes through one way. If you open the other two gates, the current goes the other way. And that's what enables you to turn the motor forward uh, in reverse. Um, and um, and I, I should say that there, there are a number of different ways you can set this up based on the kind of switches or relays that you have. Uh, and so, so this was actually a, a, good, a good choice for, for protocols. Um, so the control routines. Um, it, I thought that this would be a lot simpler than it turned out to be to get it right. Um, the world is not perfect. Things don't work sometimes, and you have to deal with that. But so it, this is sort of the naive open open door uh, routine. Um, reverse the motor, pull it up, um, wait till the roof button is closed, uh, then stop the motor. Pretty simple. Um, closing the door, just almost the same. The only difference is really that uh, when when it hits the bottom button, you want that little block to give just enough time to go to lower and let those pins slide out into the locking position. Um, so so again, pretty simple. Um, but uh, yeah, if if a button misses for whatever reason because the door gets a little slightly jammed and doesn't doesn't press the button all the way, uh, you can get various problems such as drained batteries, grumpy chickens, and not so hungry raccoons. Uh, none of which are good. Um, so uh, the solution to this was to have a retry mechanism, and um, 
the basic idea being that if it goes down and doesn't hit, it's going to eventually pull back up as the motor spins around the other way. And that's going to trigger the roof button. So we, t we detect for that and sort of deal with the cases accordingly, have a max number of retries, because we don't want to drain the battery if things just aren't working. Um, and so this is, this is kind of what this looks like in broad strokes. Uh, there's a bunch of setup crap here. Um, then, uh, oh, whoops, my bad. Uh, here we go. Where is it? OK, yeah. Um, so there's a bunch of setup here, kind of just configuring, configuring things. Um, we start lowering the door. Uh, if it closes, great. If not, there's all these sort of, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to go over this in too much detail because you know, not too much time, but just to give you a sense of like, the kind of messiness of some of the edge cases here. Uh, this is what this ended up looking like. And um, I'll talk a little bit about how I think this might be able to be made cleaner um, in the future based on some of the stuff that I'm working on. But, um, but that's how it stands right now. Um, so putting all the pieces together, um, uh, we do just do some setup and initialize some of these pins um, and buttons and um, the analog input, the H bridge or the motor control um, and um, the, the timer. I guess I should have called that time state machine or whatever. But um, then uh, we, we spin off a thread that, um, that's a status LED. And this is something I didn't really describe earlier, but it's basically just you know, controlling an LED pin turning it on and off based on a certain pattern. And so um, I was, I needed, at some point I realized I needed a way of knowing whether something had gone wrong and, um, or even just like when the board had finished booting up because the program kind of takes a while to start. And uh, so th this was one way to do that, just have this separate thread running. And um, I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Oops. Um, and then the main loop here uh, in this main function uh, just kind of spins around, has the state machine, um, updates it based on the current light level. And um, that state machine actually has the stateful open door, closed door functions in it. So as this goes, when, when the state changes, it, it executes those functions. So that's the system. Um, so just to prove that this actually worked, uh, here I'm simulating night by taking off the light sensor. Um, and so I'm not pushing the door, even though it kind of looks like it. Uh, yeah, see, there you guys are going to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, here I'm pulling up to show that it's actually locked. And here's, here's the locking mechanism here, that pin going off to the side, um, holding, holding it down so you can't lift it up. Uh, and yeah, here I'm putting, now it's daytime. And I, I'm definitely not faking this. Um, uh, and now the door goes up. And yay, everything worked. The chickens rejoice. So we are safe. And I get to sleep in. Um, so let's kind of take a step back and just talk a little bit more generally about hardware enclosure. Um, uh, first of all, uh, hardware programming is really fun. Like this was some of the first programming that I actually did with LabVIEW back when you know, I got out of college and started working in a lab. Um, and not that I'd recommend you use LabVIEW uh, if you're an actual coder, but, um, but it was really fun just to be able to kind of learn the logic of programming and, and have things in the physical world move. Like there's this real joy there when, you know, it's not just some test passes or something in the REPL works the way you thought it would, but like, an arm moves or whatever, right? Like this is really, it's visceral and there's something just really joyful about it. So, um, but with, with respect to closure, um, you know, I think that there's a strong story here. Um, physical systems are inherently asynchronous and concurrent. Like things happen at the same time and you have to deal with them. This is one of the reasons why people have been going to JavaScript for a lot of this kind of internet of things buzz that's been happening. Um, but I think closure has a strong story here. So. Um, uh, also, you know, high, le high level capabilities for dealing with complex systems. Um, obviously, you know, this is something that Clojure excels at. Um, another big thing, data is important in the Internet of Things, right? Like we've got all these devices, they're collecting data, they're dealing with data, they're talking to each other. Uh, Clojure is great for this kind of stuff. And so, again, I think, you know, it's, there's a strong case for here. And of course, we all love it. So if you're going to play with this stuff, which is fun, why not use a language that you love? Um, that's important too. So some of the cons, though, are that the JVM is not light, and you know, closure has a long boot up time, and um, you need a full operating system. So you can't just run this on Arduino. You have to actually, um, you know, you have to actually use the Fermata protocol where you're doing going over a wire, and and that's fine. But um, but it does sort of make it a little. It, it adds some barrier, but. I think that these are solvable problems. You know, boards are getting more and more powerful. They're using less and less power. Um, and uh, there's, uh, I've seen, uh, maybe someone knows about this, but I've seen a, comp, um, a project to compile Clojure to Gambit Scheme to C. Uh, so maybe, you know, uh, down the road, some native compilation targets is another option for doing things like Arduino. Um, but ultimately, asynchrony and concurrency are not going away. Like, these are problems which I think, in particular, 
as, you, as your systems get bigger, are going to be more and more um, yeah, uh, conducive to, to programming with languages like Clojure. So um, unfortunately, though, there's not a lot of um, cohesion in the ecosystem around doing device programming with Clojure. There's some folks who've done some really cool things, and we're lucky that we have uh, Karen Meyer here who did some really great stuff with a drone. I don't know where she is, but um, yeah, uh, awesome. Um, and um, Peter Schwartz and uh, uh, Narula Akaya have some really great um, libraries out there. And of course, Boris, who's also with us, um, is doing some really great stuff with sensors. And um, so there's really cool stuff happening, but there's no, there's no real library out there for dealing with a lot of these things abstractly, kind of a unified, a unified API. And so uh, I started this project, ClojureBots, um, which you can go check out on GitHub, github.com slash ClojureBots. And um, we've got a chat here too, uh, ClojureBots slash chat on Gitter. Um, if you're interested in uh, participating or want help setting something up or want to contribute. Um, and I, I, I built this, uh, I set this up as a, as a group instead of just my own project because I think this is really something that would be great for the community to own as a whole. Uh, and so I, I really do encourage you to come and join us, participate. Um, it's, uh, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so some of the goals are to have a unified API, as I said. To, to deal with these things, um, to serve as an educational resource for people who are interested in doing hardware programming or who already do hardware pro programming but are interested in closure, um, to have a sort of repository for higher level constructs or abstractions um, like, like the H bridge or the buttons or more complicated things than that even. Um, and, and also to have a simulator implementation of this, uh, of this API. Uh, one of the things I found, again, just because things are kind of slow sometimes compiling and whatever, it was really helpful just to build things on my laptop and then move them over and hope that they would work and then debug them. Um, but if you had a simulator where you could control inputs um, from some other processor or thread and, uh, and see how things work and visualize them, then that would be really helpful in development. So this is something that, um, that, uh, that I'd like to work on. Um, so the heart of this is this library called pin control. And this is, this is the abstraction library. So the idea is you would you know, program your little programs around pin control. And the only thing you'd have to do um, to switch from one device to another, you know, uh, uh, again, like Aaron granting that you, know, you have the right kind of pins and stuff, um, the limitations of the hardware, uh, is just change configuration, specify which pins are going to this and so on. And um, the, a lot of the implementation here is really inspired by core.matrix, if you're familiar with that. Um, it's a great, it, a brilliantly set up so that you can write matrix algebra and change with literally a single line of configuration the default kind of the implementation of the math going on. So you're not wed to trying this one thing and then having to switch to another being all this work. You can just write it and try out different implementations and see how the performance is. And, um, so that's, that's I, I stole a lot of the implementation code here. Um, and uh, that's, that's worked out pretty well. Um, so um, I'm just to go this kind of briefly here. Um, this is something that's a little more structured that I did. Um, is actually, there's something that you, uh, you reify or you know, implement this protocol, um, pin control implementation, that tells you how to create a new board and configuration, what the configuration of that board is so that you can simulate it. Um, and then you have a, reg a, regist a registration function which registers that implementation under a given keyword name. Um, and so that way when you create a new board, you pass that keyword name and it knows to create the right, the right kind of board. Um, yeah, so here we have the create board function. Um, we have a pin abstraction around boards, which is basically just, uh, it might be technically a lens or a, or a cursor, but uh, basically it just, it sort of wraps the board and a specific pin number and all of the functions work either on a pin or a board and pin number. Um, and so, you know, we have a bunch of sort of standard functions like how to set the mode of a pin, read the value, um, write the value, toggle it, um, and also um, some fun, oh, <laughs> Is this updated? Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess it is. Anyway, we also have some, um, some edge detection. And this is something I was talking about earlier. Um, edge detection is really cool. Um, it allows you to, instead of having a tight loop where you're checking the value of a button constantly, you can just get sort of a, an interrupt, an asynchronous message that gets passed when, when that button press happens. And um, so this, uh, this, again, is, I think, something that's really cool with Clojure. You know, we can use channels for this. And you know you can set something up that just waits for a message on the channel, and boom, executes some code when you press the button or when it releases or when some signal happens. Um, so this is pretty cool. Um, and 
I'd also, I'm thinking it might make sense to build kind of a more streaming API for these things, but um, there, there's a lot of ideas going on right now, and I sort of change my idea about things kind of frequently, so, um, or at least have new ideas kind of frequently. So, um, you know, having feedback from folks would be great. But um, some of the challenges are how to treat the, board's abstract, the board abstraction state, because it needs to know what mode each pin is in and that sort of thing. And um, the way I've sort of approached this is just to have a wrapper that keeps track of the state, but I'm thinking it might be nice to have uh, some different kinds of wrappers based on different kind of transactional needs or different, you know, if you wanted to do this somewhat more purely, maybe you could just kind of keep things as data and things would sync up to the board, um, almost like the React of, <laughs> of, uh, of BeagleBone uh, or whatever. Um, but um, I'm also, you know, I'm also concerned with whether or not there's the potential for this being a leaky abstraction, in particular with the differences between um, onboard programming, as in BeagleBone Black or Raspberry Pi, versus Arduino over Fermata. Because with, with Arduino, you, you're, you're running over a network, and um, you know, uh, without having played with it too much yet, it's, it's, it's hard to see where you might come, come into some weird issues with, with the inherent um, asynchrony of, of dealing with that, that, oh, that dealing with the wire. Um, and so, um, you know, it's something we have to think about, but ultimately I think that this is still, still a win to, to create this abstraction layer. Um, so the current status is that uh, just the other night before, uh, uh, the, yeah, not last night, night before, uh, finished getting kind of an initial thing that people could look at, um, fleshed out, um, the pin control library. And um, none of the implementations are working yet, uh, but I do have, uh, well, except for the simulator implementation, um, which, Main beaten doesn't all work, but I have at least a little bit of it working, and if we have time, maybe I'll show that to you. Um, so I probably would have done more, but um, this guy that I just hired, he's kind of needing a lot of attention uh, getting, getting up to speed. So um, he's pretty cute, though, so I think we're going to keep him around, but um, yeah, it's been kind of busy. Um, so um, yeah, uh, please join us. Uh, play with it. Um, you know, work on some implementations. Um, Build components that you know that, that sort of uh, build on top of the API. Um, contribute documentation. Anything you'd want to do to contribute would be great. Um, again, you know I think that there's a lot to offer here um, uh, for closureists and hardware. Um, it's really fun. Uh, you know we, we have the asynchronicity and concurrency story, um, and the Internet of Things is big with data, and and you know closure is powerful. So these are these are all great reasons to to kind of start checking this stuff out. Um, and like I said, there's been a lot of great stuff that's already been happening, um, but I think if we all sort of pool together our resources, uh, we, can, we can be even stronger with it. So um, just the, really quickly, the future of the, the coop. Um, maybe next talk will be an internet of chickens. Uh, I, I want to get an ethernet cable out there so that I can get notifications if something goes wrong. Um, you know, automoot poop cleanup, egg collection robot, scratch dispenser, uh, raccoon rat turret. Someone actually did a project, I think, with, with closure, with open CV and a water gun and squirrels that we're getting at the bird feeder. So maybe this can be adapted with a paintball or something. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, also, of course, live chicken cam, I think we can all agree, would be pretty awesome. Um, and um, yeah, finally, uh, thanks to my wife, Patricia, for putting up with me <laughs> and, um, and this whole project. Uh, Peter Schwartz for kind of helping me think through some of the things with um, pin control, and um, I might be using some of his libraries, wrapping them um, for the abstract API. Ben Rosas for the strange coup pun, because uh, that was awesome. Um, and Cognitech for setting up the conference, obviously, and for all of the great things that they've done. And um, with that, I leave you with some dancing chickens. <laughs>